In this episode, we're in Florida to investigate a very unexpected relationship between a dangerous predator and a gentle giant, which is overturning conventional views of these creatures' intelligence. In North America, we're finding out how we may be making one smart city dweller even smarter. In Cambodia, we're testing the intelligence of a surprisingly clever bear. But first, we're heading to Kenya, where the future of an orphaned baby elephant hangs in the balance. For nearly 40 years, the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage outside Nairobi has been rearing orphaned elephants in herds so they can be released back into the wild. But can a group of these older orphans show the empathy needed to save a very special baby? This is Endotto. He's just a year old and is one of the latest arrivals at the orphanage. Conservationist Giles Clark is joining head keeper Edwin Lesucci at breakfast time. He knows he wants to get some feed. Do you want to? Hello, beautiful. You can try. I can try. Okay, that's such a good boy. That is a serious bottle of milk. How much milk do they get? He gets four pints every three hours. Mm -hmm. I think you're finished, sweetheart. It's finished. Just look how tiny that trunk is. You can is. blow that trunk, and Hello. that's how you get to make friends with him. How do you make friends with them? When you blow down the trunk, they get to identify your scent. Really? You and blow down their trunk? Yeah, if they give it to you. Okay. Then I can't just take it. No. <laughs> Sometimes if it's itchy, we assist them to oh. scratch in silence. <laughs> they feel comfortable sometimes. Does that feel good? Is that like having a scratch? Yes, yeah, like having a scratch inside. Ndotto's been looked after at the orphanage for 12 months. His blanket is designed to recreate the warmth he would get if he still had his mum at his side. Just moments after his birth, Ndotto was found alone, confused and barely alive by local villagers who called in the team from the orphanage. Ndotto was the smallest baby they'd ever taken in and they didn't think he'd survive. But he was a fighter, and with their specialist care, he pulled through. A year later, Ndotto is fighting fit, but if he's ever going to make it back into the wild, it's crucial he starts spending quality time with the other orphans. Scientists now know that elephants live in sophisticated social groups. It's thanks to their emotional intelligence that they have such a strong sense of community, a strict hierarchy, and intricate ways of communicating. In the herd, it's the adult elephants that teach the babies this code of conduct. But there's a problem. Ndotto thinks he's already in a herd, but that herd is made up of the humans that saved his life. This means he now prefers the company of people rather than his own kind. What is he doing, Edwin? He's just playing and enjoying being with us. Just having the contact. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Baby elephants, when you squat down, you are a toy to them. So they want to play. They want to play. They want to push around. By pushing around. around. <laughs> yeah. Him coming to push is just f sort of fun or play. Okay. He's not like charging you. No, no, he's no. not being naughty. Oh, here we go. <laughs> pushing now? Yeah, he's gonna. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Don't do it. Don't push. Uh, That's a serious game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's seriously strong. <laughs> I'm trying not to push back. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, enough. Enough, yeah, thank right you. Enough. You're too strong for us. Yeah. We give up for you. <laughs> Play is an important part of growing up. 
but Ondotto has no idea that if he doesn't learn the rules of how to behave as an elephant, he risks being shunned by the herd, which could be disastrous. If an elephant is left alone, that elephant can easily be stressed to death by loneliness. You really think an elephant can die of loneliness? Yes, I have seen it happen. They almost like give up the world to give live. Give up right? the world to live because they think they're all by themselves. They don't have anyone with them and they just die from a heart broken. Bondoto cannot survive by himself. He needs the company of all the others. Edwin and the team are hoping that a group of older orphans will come to Ndoto's rescue, and that thanks to their extraordinary emotional intelligence, they'll be able to understand what he's been through and teach him what he needs to know. Good boy. Tomorrow, Ndoto will have to find the courage to bond with the herd. He'll face that challenge alone, but tonight, keeper Julius Shivega will sleep here too. Well, I'm gonna say goodnight. Yeah, very sweet, baby. <laughs> High five. You can blow, you can blow his trunk. He says goodbye, okay? <laughs> nice keeper, nice friend of ours, okay? Alrighty, thank you so much. Thank you again, Charles. He loves you because you have got a feeling for him. That's good. Don't make me thank cry. Thank you, man. See you. Thank you, bye-bye. We'll be back later in the program to see if the other elephants will show Ndoto the emotional intelligence, empathy, and the encouragement he needs to become part of their herd. 7,000 miles away in Canada, we're on the trail of a smart little animal that scientists think we could be making even smarter. In their natural habitat, raccoons are opportunistic omnivores. These guys can and will eat anything. Many have ditched the countryside and followed their stomachs to come to our cities and get at our food. Experts believe these urban raccoons are becoming more intelligent than their country cousins. So what's making these city dwellers smarter? Raccoons may look adorable, but these cheeky masked bandits are wreaking havoc in our towns and cities. Raiding dustbins, digging up gardens, and even setting up home inside our houses. In Toronto, the raccoon population is flourishing thanks to easy access to our leftovers. Residents are resorting to the bungee cord in an attempt to make their bins raccoon proof. Yet many are still waking up to find them trashed. Zoologist Lucy Cook is with Dr. Suzanne McDonald, who, for the last three years, has been using night vision cameras to study just how these raccoons are breaking into bins. It's fantastic to see how they're all just figuring it out. They are really smart, aren't they? These urban raccoons are working as a team. The bungee cord just doesn't defeat them. They flip the bin and then stretch it to open the lid just wide enough for one lucky raccoon to get inside. The rural animals never did this. Not one animal ever got into the garbage can, ever. Whereas about 80% of the urban animals figured it out. Suzanne devised other tests and the results were the same. The city dwellers always came out top of the class. I think they are street smart. They know how to approach new things and to spend some time to figure them out, whereas the rural ones don't do that. Why would they do that? They don't have to spend time figuring out human objects. Fundamentally, us creating these cities and these new environments is sort of putting a wedge in the species and sort of causing a divide. I think so, and I think, you know, raccoons have been in the Toronto area for 100 years, so that's plenty of time for evolution to happen, and it would make sense. It would be strange if it didn't happen, that we hadn't created a difference in the raccoons because they've had to live with us. They, they've evolved with us. We keep one-upping each other and the end result is a smart little raccoon. In an attempt to outwit these resourceful raccoons, experts in the Toronto Council have devised a new impenetrable bin, complete with lockable lid to foil these masked raiders. 
It may be stumping the nocturnal thieves for now, but if Suzanne is right, all it's doing is ensuring that there'll be even smarter raccoons in the future. But a thousand miles away, in NASA in the Bahamas, there's a seriously clever raccoon who's been making headlines. Beneath these sheets is a wild raccoon that's taken its relationship with humans to a whole new level. This is Pumpkin. She is 13 months old and lives with, and often on, Laura Young. Laura's family found Pumpkin with a broken leg after she fell out of a tree. Laura nursed her back to health, and although Pumpkin can return to the wild whenever she wants, she clearly prefers domesticated life with Laura and her dog. Come on, Pumpkin. She loves eggs, mm. any style, any way. But sunny side up is her favorite because of the yolk. <laughs> yeah. It's becoming clear why Pumpkin prefers living here to the wild. Raccoons are famously intelligent. What's it like sharing your home with such an intelligent animal? Every single day, it's a new adventure. She's always up to something. She's always trying to get into different things. She's always trying to open our doors. Our entire house has to be baby-proofed <laughs> because of her. She's so intelligent and she's always figuring out new little things. Every day is something new. What is she doing now? She's so clever, she's decided she wants to do some reading. Yeah. One of the things that she's taught herself to do is actually pee in the toilet. So she knows how to go up to it, pees, but she hasn't learned how to flush it yet. So we'll, we'll see if that ever happens. <laughs> she's definitely not boring. Not at all. <laughs> Every day, we're running after her. Yeah. It's like having a two-year-old permanently. It's clear to see how stimulating Laura's house is for Pumpkin. She wants to touch and sniff everything which can be a bit scary. And Pumpkin doesn't even need to see what she's pulling apart. Scientists have discovered that a raccoon's paws have more sensory receptors than almost any other mammal. The raccoon's brain is actually shaped to respond to tactile stimulation. So what that means is when they put their hand on something, they can basically see it. Their brain sees it. So it, it has an outline of what the object is in their brain. When you see Pumpkin's phenomenal dexterity combined with her ability to climb, it's understandable why Laura has to tie up or completely remove all of the handles in her kitchen. You wouldn't want this lady around your best crockery. Pumpkin's instincts drive her to investigate everything, including Laura's cupboards. But when there's a human to provide all her catering needs, it's hardly surprising this raccoon is showing little interest in life back in the wild. And just when you thought they couldn't get any smarter, there's another one across the water in Florida. With three million hits on the internet, Roxy the raccoon has become a bit of a social media sensation. What are you doing? Although this behavior may simply look cute, what's truly remarkable is this could be evidence of tool use in a raccoon, which we know is only normally associated with the most intelligent animals. She gets a rock and knocks on my door. Roxy, using a stone to bang on the glass to call for her dinner, suggests just how clever this wild animal has become. The behavior of Toronto's raccoons and the antics of Pumpkin and Roxy helps prove that wild animals become more intelligent when they master human environments. We're staying in Florida and heading to Blue Spring on the St. John's River. Every winter, it becomes home to several hundred manatees who move into the warm water refuge when the river temperature drops. Manatees, or sea cows as they're also known, are the gentle giants of the marine mammal world. They graze almost exclusively on seagrass and have relatively small brains compared to their massive bodies that can grow to almost four meters. Wayne Hartley has been studying manatees here for 35 years. 
The manatees come to Blue Spring just to be warm. That river gets down to eight degrees Celsius, and that's terrible for them. They look fat, but they don't have blubber like people think of whales. They've got to be here in order to survive. Manatees have poor eyesight, so they rely on their other senses to perceive the world. They not only have incredibly sensitive whiskers, but scientists have discovered that the hairs which cover their whole bodies make them super sensitive to their surroundings. The manatee's closest relative is actually the elephant, a famously intelligent and maternal animal. And like elephants, the females share nursing duties with each other. But another visitor in the creek is a cold-blooded killer, the alligator. And this one is bigger than most. An alligator who stays here grows much bigger, much faster than other alligators because he stays out all winter long, hunting and eating. A fearsome predator and a docile vegetarian in the same waters sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. But the crystal clear water has allowed researchers to capture on film this incredible footage of a manatee nuzzling an alligator's nose and getting no response. In 30 years, manatee expert Dr. Roger Reap has never seen anything like it. This alligator is totally comfortable having this manatee nose it and nudge it and uh essentially try to, what looks like trying to initiate play. They both seem to be interacting in a way that neither finds threatening at all. The alligator's lack of reaction is totally unexpected. Like most people, I was surprised the alligator didn't strike at the manatee. So what is going on? One theory relates to the water temperature of Blue Spring. Heated by a thermal current, at 22 degrees centigrade, it's warm enough for the manatees over the winter, but not for a cold-blooded reptile. One of the things about this environment is that the water's colder than alligators usually prefer, so they rest a lot. It seems the manatees have used their intelligence to work this out for themselves. They know it's safe to get up close, and on occasion, rather playful with their deadly neighbors. Play behavior involving alligators is something I would have never thought of until I saw this video. I think what it's telling us is that manatees are very interested in exploring their environment and finding out what's in it. They have curiosity. And so I think it's intelligent behavior by the manatees. The researchers here have observed nearly a dozen examples of these playful encounters. I've seen big adults rolling and playing, rolling over an alligator. And after 20 minutes, the alligator said, I've had enough, went out in the river. Manatees do play. They play with alligators. They play with everything out there. The alligator is just something else in their environment. And they think, hey, what can we use this for? Even a baby manatee shows no fear of an alligator almost twice its size. Playfulness and curiosity are demonstrated by the most intelligent animals. And in this remarkable new footage, a manatee appears to be using a tree stump to scratch itself, which could be evidence of tool use in manatees, a behavior only known in clever animals. So appearances can be deceptive. I think there's a lesson in here for all of us because we tend to be very impressed by fast-moving creatures such as predators. We're less impressed in terms of what we think cleverness or intelligence entails by a mammal, in this case a manatee, that's slow moving. Those are the animals we kind of consider boring or stupid. But manatees are not, as some people might think, just slow and dim-witted. Rather, there are processes going on that it's up to us to learn to appreciate. From the warm springs of Florida, we're heading 10,000 miles away to Cambodia, where there could be a new brain box on the block. This is a sun bear cub. The sun bear is native to Southeast Asia and is the world's smallest bear. 
but remarkably it has a bigger brain relative to its body size than any land carnivore. These little guys don't hibernate like their US cousins. They're always on the go. Over the past 18 years, the Free the Bears Sanctuary in southern Cambodia has rescued almost 200 bears from the illegal wildlife trade. Experts here believe that the sun bear needs to be smarter than the average bear to survive in the Asian rainforest. We're going to put that theory to the test and see how bright they really are. Sanctuary director Nev Broadis is taking biologist Patrick Ai to meet the bears and help test their intelligence. You know, one, the one thing that I immediately notice about the sun bear is that magical looking golden bib. Uh, that's where it gets its name, the sun bear from. It looks like the sun when he stands up. He yeah, absolutely adores honey. Yeah. Is that something that he'd eat naturally in the wild? Yeah, this is a once in a blue moon opportunity to come across a nice big bee's nest full of honey. A 25 centimetre long tongue and massive claws for climbing are a few of the adaptations a sun bear has to help it find food in the rainforest. But above all, they need to be very resourceful. And researchers believe this is why they are so good at solving problems. To see how smart these bears really are, we're going to set them three classic intelligence tests. First up, simple problem solving. Put some honey in that. Right. Nev fills a tube of tough bamboo with honey. It's too far down for a sun bear to reach with its tongue and is hidden by vegetation. Let me just chuck that in there. Rani. If Rani can work out first where the honey is and then how to get to it, Come on, Rani. she'll show that she can think ahead to imagine the outcome of her actions. It's a mental process that so far has only been seen in apes and some birds. She should be able to smell the honey in there, right? That's right. She'll leave her greens till last. Probably pull those out. Honey's what she's after. Yep, too deep for a tongue. Whoa! Literally one bite. Rani has cracked the first problem-solving test. She worked out that the smell of honey came from inside the bamboo, and that by using her jaws and claws, she could break it open and reach her tasty prize. But do sun bears have the brains to match their brawn? The second intelligence test centers on something called object permanence, which is the ability to understand that an object still exists, even though it can't be seen. For this test, there are three buckets and a banana reward. Five-year-old Fortnum is facing this challenge. Fortnum has to watch under which bucket the banana is hidden, then go and retrieve it. It might sound pretty simple, but scientists have shown that it's only the cleverest animals that will consistently identify the correct bucket. Once they lose sight of it, most animals would behave as if the banana no longer existed so that he can't simply sniff out his reward. Out he comes. All the buckets have been scented with banana. Well, it looks like he's going directly to bucket number one. Surprise. <laughs> ding, ding. Do you think that he's actually remembering where it is? Yeah, sure, because he's not sniffing each of the buckets. He clocked which one had the bananas in it, went straight to it. Fortnum gets it right time after time. Bingo. He's done it. 
We don't have this ability until we're over a year old, and experts believe that the skill has developed in sun bears because of the challenges they face in the forest. I think it's got a lot to do with the environment. Their territory is very large, but they have to remember where fruiting trees are, they have to remember the seasons that the trees will fruit, um, they have to remember where water sources are. So it does require a level of intelligence that perhaps you, you wouldn't find in a different landscape. The final and most demanding test is one that only the most intelligent animals, including great apes and dogs, can pass. And to make it really difficult, this one's for little Alfie, who at just 12 months old is a long way from being a fully developed sun bear. More tasty banana is put into one end of a tube. The catch is there's a sheet of perspex dividing the tube in half, creating an invisible barrier between Alfie and the treat. Coming in from the right, Alfie must work out that to get to the banana, he can't access it from this side and must go round to the other side to reach the reward. At this point, most animals would continue to reach uselessly for the fruit before giving up entirely. Perfect, look at that, getting his head well in there. Go on. <laughs> He's got it. It's taken well this done. clever one-year-old just a few minutes to solve a puzzle that baffles nearly every other species that's tried it. So it seems that the sun bear is not just smarter than the average bear, it's also one of the brainiest animals on the planet. New research is also leading us to question long-held beliefs about a very different group of animals. The idea that reptiles aren't particularly smart comes from research carried out in the 60s. But new studies at Lincoln University by Dr. Anna Wilkinson suggests the earlier experiments had overlooked a simple factor. She concluded they were failing the intelligence tests because they were simply too cold to think. Reptiles are cold-blooded, which means that they um, have to use the environment to regulate their temperature. They can't regulate it themselves. If they're from the tropics, they need to be in a tropical environment in order to be able to respond, to move about, to do anything. Anna decided to give reptiles a chance to redeem themselves. Using her pet red-footed tortoise Moses, she heated the room to a balmy 28 degrees centigrade, and she found that he could solve a food-finding test as well as a rat. To check that Moses wasn't a one-off animal mastermind, Anna tested more tortoises, and they all passed with flying colors. But Anna isn't just raising the intellectual profile of tortoises she recently turned her attention to a lizard known as the bearded dragon. What we wanted to do is test whether a totally different species had similar levels of intelligence to the tortoises, because if they did, then it might suggest that it's something which is general to many reptiles. Anna wanted to see if bearded dragons could demonstrate a gold standard of intelligence, learning by imitation rather than trial and error. If we're learning by trial and error, we have to try and do it, we have to fail, we then have to refine what we're doing. And then we need to do that in a manner that then allows us to succeed. However, if we're able to imitate another animal, if we can see that animal doing it successfully and can replicate that behavior, then it's a much, much more efficient way of solving the problem. So Anna set up a simple challenge. She put tantalizing mealworms on the other side of a gate that could only be opened by sliding it across. If the dragons were going to use trial and error to work out how to open the gate, it could take them hours. So Anna wanted to see if showing them a video of another bearded dragon solving the problem would help. Would they copy what they saw? The experiment needs a control subject who is going to get a different version of the video. Meet Tom. 
What Tom is seeing is the gate sliding open, but he doesn't get to see another bearded dragon doing that. So he knows that the gate opens and that there's food behind, but he doesn't get information about how to do it. Anna then places Tom in the same setup as he's seen in the video. To open the gate, Tom will have to use trial and error. He's certainly fixated on his dinner, but it is on the other side of the sliding gate. For Tom, the task is too much. Although desperate to get to the mealworms, he just can't work out that he needs to stop pushing and start sliding. This could go on for hours. Anna then brings in Oscar, who has shown a video that does reveal the secret of success. What Oscar sees is he sees another bearded dragon opening that gate. And then the question is, can he use that information to open the gate himself? After Oscar watches the movie, Anna brings in the gate and mealworms. An initial bout of headbanging suggests he's forgotten what he's seen in the video. But suddenly, Oscar makes a breakthrough and he's gulping down his grubby reward. He's copied the dragon in the video almost perfectly using his left foot to slide the gate to the left. For the eight bearded dragons tested in this way, the results were the same. The dragons that didn't see the solution in the video couldn't do it, but the dragons that did were munching mealworms within seconds. Anna has clear evidence that they're solving problems by imitation, and now science is rethinking the extent of reptile intelligence. For a long time, we thought humans were the only species that were able to imitate. Now we know that you can see it in other great apes and some primates, but to actually demonstrate this ability in a reptile was something which people thought could never be done. We're heading back to Cambodia, where another surprisingly smart animal is helping to save lives. A long history of conflict in this country has left it devastated by landmines. Finding these mines has relied upon experts in body armor painstakingly sweeping with metal detectors. But it's estimated that five million deadly devices still litter the countryside. Removing mines is dangerous and expensive. But that's about to change. Patrick Ayi is about to meet a crack detection squad flown in from Tanzania. And these guys are totally unique. They're rats, which are known for their high intelligence and for having a sharper sense of smell than dogs. From a few weeks old, these rats have been trained to sniff out TNT, the explosive found in landmines. They're not your common urban rat, but African giant pouched rats. They have successfully detected thousands of mines in Africa, and now Cambodia is hoping to deploy 16 of these extraordinary animals. Patrick is with team leader Thiap Bunthorn, also known as BT, and his trainee. Who do we have here and why is she playing in this giant sandpit? Her name is Layla. We put her in this to train to find the landmines. The team have buried three dummy landmines in this sandbox. Each mine contains a minuscule trace of TNT. That nose is always sniffing, smelling the area, smelling the ground, sniffing the air. Layla's handler, Mark Shakuru, is using a wire attached to her harness to guide her systematically over the entire area. And because of the tape measure from the guide wire, he knows when she is above one of the deactivated mines. Mark's eyes are fixed on Layla as he waits for her to give him the signal. But of course, he doesn't speak rat. When they sense the smell of TNT, she starts 
putting her nose into the air. Mm -hmm. And then she starts to scratch. When Layla scratches the ground like this, she's indicating that she's found explosives. You hear the sound. So it's scratching on the ground, and we heard that click. When she hears a click from Mark, she knows that she will be rewarded with a peanut or banana. It's thanks to their intelligence that these rats can be trained with food and a click so easily from a young age. Over time, the handlers reduce the TNT concentrations that the rats are exposed to until they can detect a mine buried 30 centimeters under the ground. Isn't it unfair on these rats to be putting them in, in such danger? It's not because uh, they are lighter. They cannot detonate a landmine. Because in order to detonate a landmine, you need at least five kgs. These rodents typically weigh in at around one kilo, which is one of the key reasons why Layla is considered better suited to be a mine detector than a dog. Can we actually see if she's getting this right? Because yeah, you're telling me this, but... I want to actually see if it's, it. if it's true. Yeah, I don't believe it just yet. You haven't got me just yet. Yeah. So let's see if Layla got it right. When a rat indicates a landmine, disposal experts will carefully probe, then dig around the object to reveal it. Oh, wow, look at that. OK, now oh. you see. Mm. Mark knows that the relationship between a rat and its handler could be the difference between life and death. When we go for the operational, in the real minefield, there is no markings over there. No one knows where is a mine. So you have to rely on your, 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 your rat. So you're working as a team. Layla has proved that she can pinpoint TNT in an isolated pit, and she's happy doing it. But in the real world, there will be other smells that can confuse these rats. Wow. Mark's colleague, Sharima Vandeline, is putting another African rat through a different stage of training. Because it was raised in Tanzania, this rat needs a crash course in the smells and sounds of Cambodia. This is something completely new. There are new sights, smells. I can smell motorbikes, food, spices. This is vital training to ensure that rats aren't distracted when searching for TNT. Compared to us, these rats have 50 times the number of smell receptors in their nose. So it's understandable that this rat's whiskers have gone into overdrive. As news spreads of the hero rats, many of the locals are seeing what they once saw as vermin in a new light. It's nice, yeah? Yes. But not everyone is ready to get up close and personal with a kilo of rodent. You want to say hello? Touch it. No? Hey. <laughs> Whilst the kids are inquisitive about the giant rat, the adults may take more convincing. Finally, it's back to rat boot camp for a well-earned sleep. After 12 months of training, the hero rats are just weeks from active service. Training in a sandpit is one thing, but it's vital the rats are used to working in a training field that more closely resembles the Cambodian countryside, with all the other smells that could distract these super sniffers. To make it more realistic, the team has buried all kinds of things, including discarded metal objects, which you'd typically find in the ground with mines. These objects force a human team with metal detectors to stop and carefully dig each object up, wasting valuable time. But how will the rats cope? So here you've also got other metal fragments. Yes, because we want to confuse the rats. Ah. The first decoy is a tin can. And it's right under her nose. But she's not fooled. Brilliant. But will she locate the dummy mine with a newcomer at the reins? Even with a novice like Patrick in charge, 
Layla quickly goes to work. She's got that nose in the air. Layla's scratching. That's a landmine. <laughs> hey, well done. Time for a nutty reward. There you go. Yeah, Layla yeah. doesn't miss a single marker in the whole area. It would take these rats about, what, 15, 20 minutes to search an area 200 square metres, whereas it would take a human team five days. Yes. It's so amazing. These hero rats with their astonishing sense of smell have already helped clear 13,000 landmines from Mozambique, rendering the country mine free. I hope that this tool can assist a lot in Cambodia so the people can get their lands. To get their lives back. Yeah, and their lives better off. Yeah. All because of one small rat. Yes, you are right. Layla and her sniffing bomb squad are now successfully deployed on their first official tour of duty in Cambodia. Finally, back in Kenya, it's a big day for a small elephant. For the past year, baby Ndoto has been cared for by his keepers at the elephant orphanage. But if he's going to survive back in a wild herd, he's going to have to learn how to live with other elephants. Today, we'll see whether the herd of 29 older orphans show a form of emotional intelligence, empathy, when they meet up with him. Will they give him the confidence he needs to leave his human carers and start his journey to become a wild elephant? Baby Ndotto is on his way to meet his new family. Everywhere you look, there's just elephants walking through the bush. Giles Clark is back with them. Ndotto's always preferred to spend his time with people. But Keeper Edwin's convinced all that can change. Do we think that the other elephants are really going to be able to teach Ndotto what's needed? Yeah, they, they are out, they will be able to teach him what is needed because they know he's an orphan as well like them. The time has come. The orphans have arrived. For the plan to work, Ndotto will have to be brave enough to move away from his keepers and towards the herd. This is his big chance. The enthusiastic orphans seem keen to take on their new pupil. Unfortunately, Undotto doesn't want to join in. He keeps running off. Things aren't going to plan. He's always so determined to follow the keepers. Yeah. Edwin and the team are desperate to see Ndotto have the physical contact that the other orphans have with each other. That interaction, touching and playing is very important because they get to learn from one another and socialize with one another. Okay. But despite everyone's efforts, Ndotto still wants to spend his time with people. Have time, have, have, have your time. sweet time, <laughs> and play together very well. See you later. <laughs> Don't come with me. No. <laughs> OK. After nearly an hour, it looks like there might be a breakthrough. Mbegu is a young female who, like Ndoto, has suffered. She was rescued from angry villagers who had killed her mother in front of her. In a wild herd, female elephants will look out for any youngsters. Mbegu has met Ndoto before. Mbegu has gone directly to Ndoto. Yeah, straight round, straight to him. 
Maybe she knows he needs reassurance. Amazingly, this time Endotto stays right where he is. Begu tries to see the trunk, the rest of the body, touching on Dotto. Just to reassure, just to reconfirm that all is okay. You can see him, Dotto really leaning his head up against her back leg. You know, like sometimes when a human child is with the mother, the, the baby or the human child will want to touch on somewhere on the mother's body. So like that's what Dotto is doing. Experts are only beginning to understand how Umbegu is tuned in to what Ndoto is feeling. Do you think that Umbegu somehow knows the trauma that Ndoto has gone through in the past? And that's part of the reason that she feels the need to embrace and, and take care of him. Yes. They will tend to remember everything that happened in their lives. And that's why Mbegu still knows or remembers what happened to her and her mother. And that's why she extends the love to the other orphans who come in, because she knows what they've gone through. Mbegu is showing a level of empathy scientists used to believe only humans were capable of. With Mbegu at his side, by the end of the day, Ndoto is bonding with the other orphans. and he's learning to copy the way she pulls up the tastiest grass roots. Although he does have a little way to go. But Ndotto certainly hasn't lost his love of people. He's making good progress, with Mbegu watching his every move. It's okay. It's okay. It's time to say goodbye to this determined little orphan. It seems that Mbegu can also sense that human emotions okay. are running high. Okay. She gives Giles that all-important okay. sign that she trusts him. With Mbegu's extraordinary ability to understand Ndoto's needs, his journey back to the wild has begun.